I'm so happy that you stopped by. I hope you had a beautiful Easter with your family. If you are new here, welcome. My name is Dina and I am a Catholic wife. In today's video, we are gonna be talking about public and private revelation, which one is binding on Catholics, and why I don't have a devotion to Divine Mercy Sunday. So stick with me, let's get into the video. So do you know the difference between the two, private and public revelation? I will tell you, when I first heard those terms, I assumed public revelation had to do with a revelation that was made to a larger group of people. That is incorrect. What you need to know about public revelation is it's binding on all Christians. We do not have the option to believe some parts and not believe others, to not believe any of it. It is binding on us to believe it in its entirety. Okay, well, what is public revelation? Public revelation was handed to the apostles by Jesus Christ. It is the deposit of faith, and it was handed down to the church in the form of sacred scripture and tradition. It is important to know that public revelation ended with the death of the last apostle, which we know was St. John. So once St. John died, it was closed. It can never be added to or taken away from. Any revelation that happened after St. John died is private revelation. And private revelation, unlike public revelation, is not binding on us, meaning we have the option to believe or not, to have a devotion or not. Even if it's a private revelation that Holy Mother Church says they approve of, and they recommend. So we still have the option. So an example of that would be the Holy Rosary. You can be a good and faithful Catholic and not pray the Rosary. And I think that you can also be a really awful Catholic and pray the Rosary. So I don't think that it's the devotion in and of itself that makes one good or bad as a Catholic. But if you do have a devotion to the Rosary, it can make you a better Catholic if you are doing it from a place of wanting to grow closer to our Lord, to focus on, on the mysteries of the rosary, to grow closer to our lady, to cultivate that practice of having the rosary in your life, to be praying all 15 decades of the rosary. And I think that that can help you become a better Catholic. But if you choose not to, it isn't sinful. Just like if you do not have a devotion to Divine Mercy Sunday. So if you do not pray the chaplet, the novena, you don't believe what happened to St. Faustina, any of her vision, and what was revealed to her by our Lord, that is not sinful. And I did see this discussed in several different forums where people were thinking that just because the church approves a private revelation, that then means we are required to have a devotion or to believe, which is incorrect. We do not have to have belief or practice in any private revelation. It's only binding on the person or persons that received the private revelation. So the children at Fatima, it was binding upon them. It is not binding upon us to believe that that happened. The point that we should bear in mind is private revelation is never going to reveal to the church something that the church did not already know. So it isn't that the Lord is going to speak to some person, a seer or a mystic, what have you, and give them some information that Holy Mother Church wasn't already aware of. Another thing to also bear in mind is people that receive private revelations, they are not protected from the charism of infallibility. So that is something to bear in mind. Public revelation is something that is, that is directed at the whole of humanity that God wants to reveal this to all of us and we all have this information, sacred scripture, the tradition of the church, and we have the church to help us know what it is that we need to believe as faithful Catholics. Private revelation is different. You have to have belief that the Lord can speak to us through sinful people and reveal messages to us, but it isn't sinful if you choose not to. So I think that there is confusion in that regard that you have to believe every single private revelation that Holy Mother Church says is okay to believe. So how can we even know which private revelations we should even be believing? And I would say the easiest way to know whether we should have a devotion to a private revelation is just to find out, does Holy Mother Church say that it's approved? You don't have to do anything other than that. If Holy Mother Church says that an apparition, that a private revelation is something that happened, 
and that it does not contradict the teaching of Holy Mother Church, then it's safe for you to believe it and have a devotion like the Rosary, like Fatima, like Lourdes, like Divine Mercy. Those are things that the church has looked at and says there's nothing in this that is in opposition to what the Lord said and what Holy Mother Church teaches. Now certain private revelations have not been approved. One that pops into my mind is Medjugorje. There are faithful Catholics. I know Father Mark Goring talks about Medjugorje on his channel. And I am not gonna get into that particular private revelation, but that is another case of there are good and faithful Catholics who have gone on pilgrimages and have a devotion to Medjugorje, but Holy Mother Church is still investigating and has not determined that that is something that is safe for us as faithful Catholics to believe. Now, that being said, there are church approved private devotions that I personally do not have a devotion to. I did not have a devotion to the rosary for a very long time until my husband, who has always had a devotion to Our Lady and the rosary, taught it to me. And in my reluctance to love Our Lady and learn her rosary, I did push back on that for a while. And it was something that I did not feel I wanted to participate in. I couldn't learn it. I didn't understand it. And I struggled with it for a long time. And thanks be to God that has changed. And now I have a devotion to the rosary. But during the time that I wasn't praying the rosary, that wasn't in and of itself sinful. Not praying is sinful, but I didn't have to pray the rosary, which would then lead to divine mercy. I don't have a devotion to that. Now, I'm not saying I won't ever have a devotion, but I think that it is incorrect to say that because the church has told us, okay, we have Divine Mercy Sunday coming up on the Novus Ordo side, that it immediately follows that we have to have a devotion to Divine Mercy Sunday. And I don't at this time. I am going to go ahead and read St. Faustina's diary. I know, again, Father Mark Goring has talked about St. Faustina. He's talked about her book. And there are other faithful Catholic priests who have talked about it. Father Altman, I've seen Cardinal Seraz talked about. We aren't talking about a James Martin who has a love for divine mercy. We're talking about good and holy Catholic priests who don't have a problem with divine mercy or St. Faustina. But it's something that I want to do my own research for. Now, I will be perfectly honest with you. When I was doing my research on the things that traditional Catholics tend to believe, it seemed to me that there was a lot of pushback on things that were attached to St. John Paul II. Be that the Luminous Mysteries, which we used to pray when we became traditional, it was something that, I was, okay, well, we can't do that. So I asked my husband and he said that that was okay. And we don't pray the Luminous Mysteries any longer. I think that they're beautiful, they're biblical. I don't think that there's anything wrong with the mysteries in and of themselves, but it wasn't something that Our Lady gave us at that time when the rosary was given to us. She gave us glorious, sorrowful, and joyful. She did not give us the Luminous, so we do not pray them. Another thing is theology of the body. We don't have an issue with that. I know that when we were first coming back into the church, we actually went to a talk by Christopher West and we were in a much different place in our faith and returning to the church. We hadn't come into the Latin mass or traditional Catholicism at that point. And it was something that really wasn't well received by my husband. So we kind of steered away from that. So I don't have anything really to speak about with Theology of the Body. Do you have issue with that or Christopher West? I'd love to hear your comments down below. And lastly would be St. Faustina and Divine Mercy Sunday, the Divine Mercy Chaplet and the promises attached. There are people that have issue because St. John Paul was the one who went ahead and pushed that forward. I personally don't have a devotion to Divine Mercy Sunday, to the Chaplet, to the Novena, to anything to do with St. Faustina, only because I don't know enough about it to have an educated response to that. And when I was doing research about it, which I think is something that could be happening with traditional Catholics, is it seems like all the traditional Catholics are doing one thing. And so to be a traditional Catholic, you also have to do that one thing. So if traditional Catholics don't pray the Luminous Mysteries, well, then you can't. And if traditional Catholics are veiling, then you have to. And I don't know that that's necessarily true and accurate. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, on what you think. Do we all have to be doing the same thing to be seen as traditional Catholics? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And I don't have a devotion to St. John Paul. And I think that the main reason for that is, is that even though I am a cradle Catholic, I was not in the church, you know, for pretty much his entire pontificate. And by the time he died, we still really hadn't returned to the church fully. 
So I never developed that feeling or love for him. So I don't have that automatic reaction when I hear his name. Now I did in my research find things that he did that I think are were alarming. My husband agrees. He happens to have a love of St. John Paul II. And when we talked about these things, he also had an issue like St. John Paul II, you know, kissing the Quran and how Protestants love to to use that against us. But you know, what he said was he was a sinful man, just like every single person that has sat in the chair of St. Peter. He is a sinful man and he made mistakes and he did things that were wrong, but he also did lots of great and beautiful and holy things. So I think that we have to be careful as traditional Catholics, as Catholics in general, not to just automatically assume that because a certain group of traditional Catholics say one thing about this man, everything else associated with him was bad. So I'd like to hear your thoughts. What do you think? St. John Paul II and the things that are attached to him, for, against, share with me in the comments down below. If you have an aversion to Divine Mercy Sunday, the devotion, the chaplet, St. Faustina, let me know, how did you make that decision? For me, I've never read her diary. And the information that I gleaned from what she was saying was only found in little snippets. And I'll share with you something that had happened when we were talking about this. And I brought this to my husband, which I do whenever I get confused with anything Catholic, I like to run it by him. He just has the ability to see information and kind of boil it down for me in a way that I can understand. And so all these ideas that I have, I always run them by him just so he can make sure I'm not going off the rails on something because I will hear things in traditional circles and I'll think, okay, well, that's the way that we need to go on a certain thing and I'll bring it to him. And then he'll kind of pump the brakes on me and we'll have a discussion and he'll explain it to me. So with this thing with St. Faustina, someone had sent me a screenshot of part of her diary. I haven't read her diary. And so when I read this, I was really taken aback when I read this particular entry in her diary. And what it had said was that she had gone to confession. Her confessor was then celebrating the mass. And when he was up on the altar confecting the Eucharist, the child, the baby Jesus had appeared that the priest was holding the baby Jesus, I believe. And then he was consuming the baby Jesus, not in the Eucharist, but him as a child. And when I heard that, I was really, it really freaked me out and I didn't like it. I didn't like the feeling I had about it. And I pushed back from that, that information. And I brought that to my husband and can you believe this has happened? I mean, so of course we can't have a, a devotion to divine mercy. And so he said, okay, that in and of itself does seem kind of alarming, but read to me the before and the after, and then read it all together. And I did that and he explained it to me and it wasn't so odd to me when the way that he explained it. So I think we have to look at things in its totality and not just assume that because some traditional Catholics might have issue and we can't even know what their issue is. It could be the same thing that because this one group of traditional Catholics said it was wrong or we shouldn't do it, then none of us should do it. Do your own research, run things by your priest. If you have a good and holy priest, talk to your husband's ladies, run it by them, see what they think. And don't fall into the trap of feeling like we have to check all the boxes to be good and faithful Catholics because a certain group of traditional Catholics are doing one thing or the other. I think that the majority of us probably came up through the Novus Ordo. And now we have discovered the beauty of the traditional Latin mass, the beauty of traditional Catholicism. And if you're anything like me, I just want to learn all the things about tradition, Catholicism, how we got to this place, what happened to the mass. And it is very easy to fall into the sin, I think, of pride. It's very easy to have this us versus them mentality and forget that we are a part of Christ's church. Even if we happen to attend the Latin Mass, if you happen to attend the Novus Ordo Mass, if you are baptized, confirmed Catholic, you are part of Christ's family. And I don't ever want to look at this from the point of, I have this, I am superior because I happen to go to the Latin Mass or because I happen to love traditional Catholicism. Quite frankly, this has nothing to do with me. I am a traditional Catholic. I am a Catholic because of the grace of God. That is it. Not because of Dina and her ability to find information on the internet or read the Dewey Rames Bible or watch Census Fidelium and listen to Father Ripiger. None of this has anything to do with me. I am so blessed and fortunate and thankful to God that he has allowed me to see the mass, see the traditional Latin mass, but it isn't because of anything that I did. And I'm no better 
than the person who's sitting at the Novus Ordo Mass, doing the best that they can, reading their Bible, trying to be a good and faithful Catholic, praying the rosary, wearing a veil, not wearing a veil, listening to census fidelium. It's more than just the Mass that we attend. And I think we have to be so careful not to fall into the sin of pride and thinking that we somehow are superior, that we have stumbled into this treasure trove of information because now we know the truth and it's withheld from these these people who are just so ignorant because they're going to the Novus Ordo Mass. I think that that's wrong and I would encourage you not to do that. I think it's important to remember as Catholics, as traditional Catholics, who are on a quest to learn about our faith, about Holy Mother Church, about the things that she teaches, and trying to learn all things traditional to be firmly rooted in Christ's church. Don't ever think you have to be like every other traditional Catholic to be a good and faithful Catholic. I don't think we should automatically dismiss things just because other traditional Catholics tell us that they're not doing it. Don't just assume that because certain traditional Catholics are doing something, that's the only way to be a good and faithful Catholic. You can still be a good and faithful Catholic and not go to the Latin Mass. I am so grateful that I happen to be so blessed to be married to a good and holy Catholic man who can work through my crazy, explain things to me in a way that I can understand without ever making me feel simple or small or stupid that I don't know things. He's been such a gift to me and my faith that I am so grateful and I hope you have someone like that in your life that can help you in the areas that you might be struggling. Of course he is not perfect, he is a sinner just like me, but his primary goal is to help get me to heaven and I am so eternally grateful for this man and his love of the Lord and Our Lady and the Church and me and our sacrament that he's always trying to help me get closer to God. I am a traditional Catholic, a wife and a mom, and I happen to attend the Latin Mass. It doesn't make me any better than you. I don't have a secret that other Catholics can't find out. The Latin Mass, while I wish it was available to everybody, isn't the only way to be a good and holy and faithful Catholic. It isn't available to everybody. We all don't have the option to go to the FSSP down the road. Some of us happen to live in areas where we're just grateful that we have a diocesan Latin mass available to us. So I think that we have to remember that we all are not in the same place, in the same circumstances. We all don't have the same opportunities. There are ways that we can be faithful, traditional Catholics without just going to the Latin mass. Please don't hide behind the Lord, sacred scripture, traditional Catholicism, or even your own pride. If that means you're looking down on someone else who might not be in the same place as you are in the faith. The bottom line for me is this. I am a faithful Catholic wife, mother, and soon to be Nona, and I fully submit to the Vicar of Christ. I trust in Jesus that he established this church, which will know infinitely more than Dina, a Catholic wife on YouTube. Thank you for allowing me to share this with you. I hope I've explained the difference between private and public revelation to you. I hope you will consider subscribing and sharing my video if it was helpful to you and leaving me comments down below. I appreciate your prayers and I do hope you will come back next week. I'm gonna be releasing my videos every Thursday and I hope that I will see you next week. Take care and God bless.